Okay, thanks very much, um, Helen, and and thank you, Rick. You, you've covered quite a bit of the things that I was uh, going to talk touch on briefly, so I'll probably be able to uh, cut cut short the time in that case. Um, yes, look. Uh, so the cobalt cobalt um, compilation. I, I guess before we kick off, first here here is the link that has uh, just gone up on online. So thank you very much for that, uh, Matt uh, Matt Greenwood. Uh, and I certainly wanted to offer these acknowledgements for, uh, for for a lot of help with all of this work and, and input to it. Um, firstly, the GSQ for, for the funding and the technical support, as Rick has mentioned, but also specifically with the Cobalt, um, uh, Dave Purdy, um, Coralie Siegel um, for, from GSQ and now with CSIRO, Coralie, and uh, and these, these people from within uh, SMI itself. So certainly thank you for all of those people and their assistance. Um, look, I will. Um, I'll, I'll give a rough uh, overview, and, and I guess most people are sort of probably aware of these these types of uh, facts for cobalt. And on the left is is production, and I guess the um, you know the most robust figures are, are from a little well it's a decade ago now. But anyway, um, so the production on the left is deposit style, and production on the right by country. And the immediate thing that uh, that strikes you with with cobalt is that the the production is, is totally dominated by the stratiform sediment hosted copper cobalt um, deposits. And within that, within that type of deposit, it is pretty much all from uh, the, the African copper belt, um, the DRC and, and Zambia. Uh, and that's 60% of the production in 2011. Uh, and then you step down to the uh, magmatic nickel, nickel copper deposits, sulphide deposits, and then the nickel cobalt um, laterites. And then here you have the other terrestrial deposits are essentially two percent, which is which is um, you know pretty pretty low. So so you'll see that that and, and Rick in one of his early slides um, uh, was was talking about primary and byproduct or secondary commodities, and and you can see that the, the predominance of cobalt um, production globally is as a byproduct of three deposit styles. And I guess it's no surprise that the, the, the predominance of, of production is from um, the DRC. Uh, and then you have this spread of countries all, all sort of between about 2 and 6% um, production and with Australia sitting in there at, at 4%, which I presume is, is from the uh, magnetic nickel copper um, commodity related um, deposits and, and some laterites uh, as well. So that's, that's sort of where cobalt production uh, stands at the moment. Now, the interesting, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, once you start looking at grade, those deposit types split out pretty, pretty nicely. Um, and you'll see that the African copper belt is, is the high grade uh, material up here. Uh, and then you go down through the laterites and the magmatic nickel copper PGEs uh, basically sit down, down the bottom end there. So this, this is cobalt grade in percent on, on the left. So you see that's um, the African copper belt deposits um, just touch above, above 1%. And then you get down to below about 0.2% um, or, or 2,000 ppm. And then you start getting down towards the, the hundreds of ppm down at the right-hand side here. Uh, so, so sort of that's, that's where they sit grade-wise. And then it's interesting to have, have a look and, uh, and see what happens with uh, the, the known Queensland mineral resources. Uh, and you can see that, um, that you, you have um, Walford Creek and Millennium are sitting up there at the... Um, at the, at the top um, of the grade in, in Queensland, um, both 0.14% um, cobalt. And then you go down through SCONI, the, um, the, the nickel um, scandium cobalt uh, laterite, and then you get into Mount Oxide and Rocklands, which sit down the, down the, down the bottom end of that, uh, that scale. So just, just to show you that those, those, those are the Queensland uh, mineral resources that are known, and that's where they, where they sit in terms of grade. Um, now, Rick, uh, Rick was showing you that, um, that, that the rare earth deposits, there's a, there are a variety of deposit styles and uh, cobalt is, is no exception. And, and essentially I've listed what I think it's nine deposit styles here. And you'll, you'll see that the, the top three are these deposit styles that have the, the majority of the, the production. I, I think it was what, 96% of the global production. And then you have these other uh, deposit styles that form either, either lesser production, for example, the, the Idaho cobalt belt types, uh, or, or not a lot of production in terms of EMS or IOCG. And, and a lot of the IOCG deposits are, are um, uh, well, not even really producing cobalt. So it's, it's more a resource uh, for the future. Uh, so plenty of deposit types, 
Um, and, and as Rick, Rick noted, for example, the Geoscience Australia um, study uh, into the, that was so successful into uh, nickel copper uh, magmatic sulphide deposits was one, one deposit type. And, and here, here we've looked at, at, at quite a few uh, different deposit types. So um, it, it's quite a lot of extensive uh, amount of data. And before we actually go and look at look at some of the targeting, this is this is uh, that grade plot again, and you recall the Queensland deposits here. But I wanted to put on a couple of deposits um, by deposit type, and you'll see that um, we'll talk about these in a minute. But um, Telvavara is is a Finnish um, black shale hosted deposit, which is down at two hundred ppm cobalt. Santo Domingo is is an ISCG deposit that is um, going to be producing cobalt when it comes into into production and it's sitting at 230 ppm. So re relatively low levels, but, but, but large tonnage deposits. And then you step up to the, the high grade end, which is the Blackbird Idaho Cobalt um, Belt, which, which this, this is a, a, an average of, I think about 10 deposits there is 0.73% cobalt. And then Boazair um, in Morocco, I think it is, is, is well up on the high grade. It's a, it's a, a mafic ultra mafic hosted um, veined Positive is my understanding, and it's just over one percent um, cobalt. So there's a big, big stretching grade here, and and in terms of production, that that really ranges from the high grade small mines to the bulk tonnage mines. Um, you know, very much a byproduct. So just to step a little bit further, um, this is this is the uh, this is those those different deposit types that we were talking about here. They're plotted as as different symbols, uh, obviously. Um, and just what I wanted to show is that. If, if you look at the, at the high um, production and, and the high resources, and this is the, the, exactly the same sort of plot that Rick was showing for rare earths in, in terms of log, log, log plot with the tonnage along the bottom and the, uh, and the grade on the left here, and then these, these, um, these, these ISO lines of, of contained, um, contained cobalt. And so uh, Komoto, the, the, the um, African copper belt um, deposit, and then these uh, magmatic um, sulphide deposits, all, all are the, the large resources. Um, but then when you, when you look at, at that, the high-grade resources are all of the um, sedimentary copper, copper cobalt um, deposits, uh, um, typically from the, um, from the African copper belt. And then down the bottom right here, you have the ISCG in the, in the, blue, in the blue diamonds. Um, so, so some of those are Olympic Dam, um, Ernest Henry, um, um, and and some of the Chinese, and and uh, I think this is Green Mount even up in the Mount Isa uh, in Lana. Uh, so, so that's where the ICG sit, and then uh, the the other major class of cobalt deposits, the meta sedimentary cobalt deposits, which is the Idaho group, uh, but they're commonly found in um, also in you know, a lot in Finland, uh, sit here in this this red circle. This uh, deposit up here, Blackbird, is, is actually, I guess, the type example of, of the Idaho um, style, and, and it's it's a it's a little bit higher grade than than, than the bulk of those uh, those deposits. Uh, so that's just a bit of a quick quick flick. Um, what what I wanted to do was uh, I, I know Rick ran through quite a lot of the deposit styles, but I just wanted to run through one as a bit of an example of, of how we've done the done the targeting. And um, given, I guess, IOCG and, and nickel, nickel, copper, um, magmatic deposits, uh, for example, are, are pretty, pretty well known. And nickel laterites, I thought I'd choose something a little less, um, less uh, front of mind for people. And that's the meta sedimentary copper, cobalt, gold um, deposit. And uh, and the the primary deposit or, or the key deposits are there in the Idaho copper belt, but they're also uh, elsewhere around the world. And they're an interesting. Um, they're an interesting um, bunch of deposits. They're, they're commonly hosted in luminous plastic sediments. They have um, interpreted as epigenetic um, and they have sort of biotite scapolite schists in many deposits. They're generally considered pre or syn uh, metamorphic deposits, which, which when we're thinking about targeting starts to cut down our time ranges in, um, in, in Queensland. And you'll see that certainly on the East Coast, I've, I've basically any, anything... I guess Jurassic or, or younger, I've taken off the table simply because you, you're post-orogenic by that stage. Um, some of them are sometimes ascribed to the IOCG clan uh, based on their, their tectonic setting, their, their mineralogy or, or their geochemistry, particularly with rare earth element um, concentrations. Um, and the Blackbird Mining District in Idaho, I guess, is the type example. But uh, here in Queensland, the Mount Cobalt deposit 
is also included in this uh, in this category by by Slack uh, 2013, which was the, the USGS or the big compilation that happened in, in 2013. So that's what these deposits look like, and and you'll see here that they're they're essentially in these uh, in these thrust terrains with uh, with moderate uh, grade metamorphic rocks um, or, or to higher grade, I guess, if you get up to amphibolite facies. Uh, so that's that's what they look like. So. If, if you want to go uh, looking for those in Queensland, and, and this is the mineral system to mappable criteria process that Rick outlined that, that really has, has been, um, I guess, done so well in this country, particularly by um, Geoscience Australia recently. Um, so, so we've looked at the, the deposit type, which is the metasedimentary um, cobalt copper gold deposits, the mineral system, you know, the, the source, the drivers, the, the pathway and the, the depositional gradients. The theoretical criteria, what, what are we actually hoping to see that will give us an indication that we're seeing these mineral system components? And then if we look actually in the data, what do we need to map to see them? And what data sets do we need to be, um, to, to be seeing those uh, components? So that's, that's, that's the summary. And, and in the report, when you look at it, you'll see that for those, um, we've done six of the nine um, types of deposits. And you'll, you'll see that we've, we've run through this process for all, all six of those. Um, and, and this is basically, you, this is similar, I guess, to what Rick was showing, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on it. It's basically looking at these different data sets and, and how we can use them to map the source, the drivers, et cetera. So, for example, in, in the sources here, um, we, we've used um, shallow crustal mafic material from, from the geological mapping, uh, also from geophysical interpretation. We've used the, um, the OSREM rem data um, as, as we, we've pretty much taken the approach from Geoscience Australia there. We've, we've looked for marine carb carbonates or evaporites in the detailed geology, the, um, the heat flow in the upper crust from the, the Geoscience Australia Oztemp map and felsic intrusive bodies, for example, both from the detailed geology, for example, here you see in, in red, uh, from the undercover Thompson Origin Basement interpretation by the GSQ here in the south of the state, and elsewhere, we've looked at, at some of the geophysical data sets and, and tried to interpret where those large um, felsic batholiths that could potentially be, be heat drivers may be in these areas undercover. Um, and then we've also looked at, at the fluid flow pathways and those ore depositional gradients as well. And Rick spent a bit of time talking about mineral occurrences, and we've certainly used them pretty, pretty extensively in this, uh, this study. I, I mean, really... Mineral occurrences are, are sort of a, almost the most reliable geochemistry to a certain extent. So it's, um, you know, they should not be overlooked. Um, so what did we come up with? Um, so looking at the metasedimentary deposit model, for example, we've, we've highlighted four, four areas. Um, it hasn't gone down to the, the absolute, um, I guess, detail that Rick, Rick has potentially gone to in terms of um, individual target targets, but what, what we've basically been looking for is to say, well, this, this is a new type of deposit that hasn't been extensively explored for in Australia, as, for example, IOCG or nickel, magnetic nickel deposits have. Um, so, so let's first highlight some areas, broad areas, where we see those components that we're looking for, uh, where you may think that you, where, where people really haven't uh, had, a, had a good crack before. Um, so, so a couple of these areas, so there's the Mount Isa province came up on, on the, in the west here, and obviously you, you can see that on, on the legend here, the, the cobalt, copper and gold occurrences um, really pop up around Mount Isa. And, and what we did, for example, was just take that occurrence database and look for the, the deposits that, that had cobalt, copper and gold within their list of, of, of all commodities that are present there. So Mount, Mount Isa re really stands out. And, and if you look at the metasedimentary style, you've also had those aluminous clastic metasedimentary rocks, the carbonates and calcilicates uh, that could potentially be giving you those saline fluids and the widespread um, mafic rocks that you're hoping to leach your, your cobalt from. So that's, that's a bit of a no-brainer no out there at um, Mount Isa. Other places that came up were the uh, Etheridge province. Um, and you'll see here that you, you've got the, the, the carbonate calcilicates in blue, the aluminous clastics in, in brown, and those mafic and ultramafic units as well. And there's actually one, one occurrence there of, of cobalt, copper, gold uh, occurrence. So that's, that's, that's another area that, uh, that popped out. If we move down to um, southeast Queensland, uh, there are two zones there. There's the Gogango thrust zone, uh, which, which has that, that combination of, of aluminous uh, host rocks and, and, and carbonates and um, and also um, 
and, and some, um, you'll see the mafix and, and, and there are some ultra mafic rocks as well over here. Uh, that's the Princester Serpentinite. Um, and then finally, uh, zone four down the bottom, down around Gympie, uh, we, we find that right mixture of, of rocks as well. And you'll also see that there, there is one copper cobalt um, gold occurrence down there. So it's, it's a bit of a mix within, uh, within Queensland. You have some of the Proterozoic uh, areas, but then you have these Paleozoic areas uh, down, down here to the, uh, to the east. And, and I guess we, we'd be looking at the Hunter Bowen orogeny as, as potentially being involved in, in creating those um, metasedimentary rocks. Um, so as, as I noted earlier, the, these are the, the nine deposit styles and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to put, put all of that data together uh, when you look through the, the literature in terms of the source and the transport, the trap and, and the drivers. And, and I guess the things that, that come out really are uh, if you, you um, have a look at this um, source, mafic or ultramafic rocks are just so uh, important in, in getting these cobalt deposits um, to form. And, and those matrix uh, ultramafic rocks are, are not, not host rocks, but they are in, in the vicinity and presumably the, um, the source of the cobalt. So you know, a very critical component of all those deposit types. And the other thing, when you look at this table that you see, in, in when you look at this, I guess, alphabet soup of, of elements over here in the, in the deposit types, um, nickel and copper are really the, uh, the association that, uh, that comes out here. So it's, um, it's, it's really, really critical to be taking heed of those, those elements. Um, I won't dwell too much on, on this is just co cobalt versus copper plot, and, and it's basically to show what, what I think is, is, is an important point is that when, when we think of cobalt production and we think of the DRC and Zambia and the African copper belt, um, you know, you, we think of all the cobalt flowing out of there. But when, when you go around globally and have a look at the sedimentary um, copper cobalt deposits, um, really the DRC or the African copper belt is the standout and, and it's the one that has the cobalt in it. And even within the African copper belt, for example, I think it's Kamoa Kukula, does not have a lot of cobalt in it. So, so it's, it's not a, a case of let's go and find the sedimentary copper deposits because I'll have cobalt with them because the DRC is, is a relatively rare example of that. Um, and this is, this is the very generic cobalt model. Um, you saw Rick, Rick showed um, this type of diagram for the rare earth, but, but what, what we've done here is, is basically take these nine mappable criteria which, which occur in, in many of those deposit types and say, let's, let's normalise them and equally weight them um, throughout the model and, uh, and then, then sum them essentially. And then this is where you end up, uh, the red bits, obviously the, the, the higher prospectivity for a very generic cobalt model, which to a certain extent tie in, in reasonably well um, with those other, um, other, other deposits, that, deposit areas for, for prospectivity that we were looking at with the metasedimentary um, rock. So it's um, yeah, it's it's very very interesting to put all of that data together because I was I hadn't done a lot of work with cobalt previously, but when you start looking at it, you realise how how poorly defined the cobalt um, deposit models are to a certain extent, and and they have so many overlapping um, overlapping geological elements that it's it's interesting to put them all together and, and perhaps maybe not be too too bleak at about what type of cobalt um, deposit you're actually looking for. Um, look, to, to sum up, um, at, a, at a high level, there's pretty much about four, I guess, high-level deposit forming processes, um, which, which, is, <laughs> which, which when you look at the geological spectrum, most of it is, is covered by, by cobalt deposits. So you have the magmatic deposits, which, of course, are the nickel, copper, BGE, um, magmatic sulphide deposits. You have the hydrothermal deposits, the sediment-hosted copper cobalt, uh, IOCG, um, carbonate-hosted um, copper cobalt, um, which I, I, I guess an example here in Queensland is the, the uh, Walford Creek deposit. You have the metasedimentary Idaho types and you have something I haven't spoken a lot about, the five element um, vein type. Sin sedimentary, you have the black shale hosted um, nickel zinc um, copper cobalt deposits, which are probably the least, least common of the deposits, uh, the prime example being in Finland. And then you have the supergene nickel uh, cobalt laterites which is um, you know, a super gene process, but obviously harking back to, to, to the, the rocks that, that are being weathered are actually the ultramafic magnetic rocks. So it's, um, 
So it's 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 interesting when you look at, at cobalt deposits how how much they span the geological um, spectrum. So in in summary, I guess what we see is that this 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 exercise we we. It's most detail in the exposed terrains, as, as you can expect, and, and we, we tried to look a little undercover in terms of with the geophysical data, but you really need a bit more to, to move undercover um, more deeply. And, and I guess it's also a matter, too, of spending some more time and looking, looking at the drill data that's available uh, in those areas. Um, we haven't dealt with the subsea deposits here, and, and it's, it's interesting. I showed those, those plots at the start that show um, you know, where, where the cobalt resources are distributed in terms of deposit types. But when you look at all of the cobalt resources, obviously not jaw quarry, not 43, 101 compliant, but 83% of those estimated resources are actually subsea deposits. So the, the, the terrestrial uh, deposits are only 17% you know, of, of the total cobalt um, that we, we know about. Um, there are five well-described heavily explored deposit types um, that have current or potential cobalt byproducts. And you can see them listed there as those key deposit types. But there are three others that are poorly defined and, and they're poorly understood, um, but they have the relatively broad elements in common. And those being, I, I highlighted the ultramafic and the mafic um, rocks, typically not as a host, but as a potential metal source. Um, the variety of metals in the mineralisation, um, you know, so many different, different associations of, of metals, uh, but cobalt, nickel and copper are, are a real common thread through this, uh, through this um, cobalt deposit types. And then um, when, when you look at those poorly defined elements, there's, there's a common sedimentary host. Um, so there's the black shale deposits, there's the um, carbonate hosted deposits, and then there's those uh, metasedimentary siliciclastic aluminous successions. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde um, element. There are some really well-known deposit types, but there's a bunch that aren't, aren't really well defined. But um, if, if, you, if you can find them, they, they may not be the size of the, um, of the nickel, copper, uh, magmatic sulphide or the laterites, but you can get some pretty good grade and you'll be getting some good um, cobalt production out of them. Uh, yeah, so look, I will, um, I'll leave it there, but that's basically where we got to with the, um, with the cobalt work. And here's the, uh, here's the link here. It's, it's hosted on the um, GSQ website. And um, so we certainly want to, there's a big thank you on that slide. And, and I want to say thank you to the GSQ for, for allowing us and funding us to do this, this work. because It's been a fantastically interesting exercise and I'm looking forward to seeing these new um, cobalt discoveries over the coming years. So thank you. That's the aim, isn't it? It is. That's that's why we're yes. here. Yeah. No, awesome. I'm loving this. Um, right, a question for you, Paul. Mm. Um, oh no, maybe <laughs> I think this might be a rare earth one. Actually, just reading through it. Um, but I have a question. So both you uh, and we'll come up back to the rare earth one in a moment. Both you and Rick um, showing these gorgeous maps you know, with, with um, various sort of components coming together to, to build a prospectivity model. But obviously there are some areas where the data is very sparse and there are areas where the data is very, very dense. And, you know, the unsurprisingly, a lot of the areas that you're both identifying as being higher in prospectivity are areas where we actually have more information. Mm -hmm. So in those areas where we have very little information, um, and they're sort of, you know, more um, blank areas across the across the state. What is the sort of data that you think we need? And I guess I'm asking this from the government point of view in terms of what we can do to help that situation. So, what is the sort of data that you think we need to be able to um, improve the analytics through those areas? Improve the the different streams of data that we can pull together to understand um, these style types of prospectivity models built on mineral systems. Yeah, I, I, I can certainly comment on that, that Helen. It's and, and it's it's so true. And I've I've had conversations with Vlad Lasitsin about this, and and he specifically asked me, for example, we've just been working on the tin tungsten compilation together. I'll talk about it a bit later. And he specifically said, look, can can you put in your GIS a field for certainty? 
because what always happens is, is we have uh, so much data in the outcropping areas, but, but where we, we don't have um, that outcrop, we don't have so much data, so, so that we really need to allow for that. Yeah. But, but, but in, t- in terms of your, your actual, actual question, I guess, about what can we do, um, obviously um, geophysical data is there, but um, really, really, I, I think probably what we need to do is put more time into looking at drill holes that are available. For example, there was some discussion early about the drill hole. Um, I've forgotten the the, um, the, the hole that um, Ken Collison uh, yep. was involved in drilling the Makati or Kakati, I'm sorry, what it's called. But they're the sort of holes that, that, that are way out in the middle of nowhere and you have that hole into the basement. And what you really need to do is if you have those holes is to just extract as much information as you, you can from all of those holes and, and really, really throw the, the kitchen sink at it. Because you, you can have the geophysical data and it's tougher with, with surface geochem at those depths. But um, if you have that hole that's, that's getting down into that little, little um, pinprick of information down the bottom, you want to draw as much of it as you can um, out of those drill holes. So, so I think really going to, to look at drilling that has intersected basement and covered areas and, yeah. and even, even if we're going back to existing holes and, and drag as much information as we can out of those holes. Fortunately, we're doing that. <laughs> good, good to see. Phew. Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, Anthony Burnham is asking, and he's saying this is applicable to both cobalt and rare earths, in mapping for evaporites to build the potential map that you've used for carbonatites as a proxy, just wondering about the risk of false positives and negatives. Um, enormous. The um, so I don't. I'd have to go back and double check, but I don't think I used. Um, I don't think I used carbonates as. Uh, I don't think I did that for carbonatites, but but for certainly for um, um, you know for IOCGs, for example, um, both um, the the sort of Skiro et al. work that was done on in the exploring for the future work in the Tennant Creek Isa region and the work we did, tried to extract sodic calcic alteration and, and evidence of evaporites. And, and the way I did it was really simplistic. It was, you know, a lot of the, the geological data sets, the solid geology interpretation that the, or, you know, the, all of those data sets have got long text fields where you can search for words that um, allow you to extract whether you know, you look for the search for the word calc silicate um, or, uh, uh, you know, any other sort of indicator of, of something that might tell you that there's an evaporite there. Um, it's very, you know, I'm sure there are better ways to do it. But the problem is with the data that you have, um, that's, you know, that's, that's what you can do. So I did a lot of, and I think Paul as well did a lot of lithology extractions where, where you're just searching for anything in the description that might allow you to to, um, you know, uh, understandably, you know, the way we define our geology is, is mainly by stratigraphy, but actually for targeting, we want to define it by characteristics. And so it leads you to making a whole series of, of different fields. And that's why I, I took the, the, um, the regional um, solid geology data set and classified it into competent and incompetent mixed reduced, oxidized, and that sort of thing to try to get at, at those sorts of factors. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not easy. Um, and then the only other thing I want to mention was, and, and I think this applies to both the cobalt and the rare earth work, is that we did try to, uh, I certainly had different criteria for covered regions and outcropping regions. So when you look at the report, all of the formulas that I used for the calculations, because I've I'm old and did it in ER Mapper, even though ER Mapper isn't really being supported anymore. Um, the I, all the formulas there say there's one formula for covered regions, and or, or many of the formulas say there's one for covered regions and one for one for exposed regions. So, um, yeah. Good, cool. Um, Benham Sadegi is suggesting. Um, in terms of those areas of sparse 
sparser data, satellite imagery and remote sensing, but I think that doesn't really solve the issue of cover versus outcrop then. Um, but definitely, you know, any, any kind of remote sensing in geophysics is, is something that we've got to use over those vast tracts of land. Mm -hmm. And John Huntington has made the comment uh, that he thinks he's seen signs of porophyllite in the Lake Machati drill hole, which might be worth looking at more closely to see what that is telling us. Now, over in the chat, um, Ken Collison has got a question for Paul. So at Mount, Mount Cobalt, some of the highest cobalt, heavy rare earth, gold and PGE concentrations are hosted by altered ultramafics and hydrothermally altered olivine peroxinite. How do these fit into your sediment hosted model for Mount Cobalt? Uh, yeah, look, what, what I would say is that um, on that slide, the metasedimentary model, I, I put that the USGS has clumped these uh, Mount Cobalt into that model, but um, I, I certainly wouldn't vouch for that, um, basically because I've not, not seen Mount Carbon sorry, Mount, um, Mount Cobalt. So, um, you know, if it's, if it's well, I guess you, you'd be, you, you, you're highly familiar with it, Ken, but hosted by those ultra, ultramafics, you know, I wonder if it isn't more like the Boazir type of um, ultramafic hosted um, high-grade deposit. Mm. Yeah. So, so, yeah, basically, basically the an answer is, uh, sorry, what, I, I did put it on my slide, but it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the disclaimer up there. <laughs> the um, <laughs> yes, yeah. And all right, and then Aranda is asking: um, Is the National Drilling Initiative from the Minex CRC um, involved? That might be a useful or complementary way of filling in some of the gaps for the cobalt case, and probably for the rare earth case too. Um, and I guess um, <laughs> the National Drilling Initiative is, is an Australia-wide initiative. It's currently, well, they've been focused the last year or so in the Northern Territory and currently moving down into uh, New South Wales, I think, at the moment. So um, what we're doing in Queensland is using uh, as many company drill holes on a regional scale as we and undercover as we can get our hands on. And we've got some fantastic data sets that we're working through and permission from companies to resample. So to fill in those undercover gaps and then be able to build out, you know, further and further away from known geology. 